before I start, uh, I want to, of course, thank UX Belgium for the opportunity to talk. Uh, very excited to be here and like actually already uh, pinpointing into one of the trends of 2024 I'm very excited about uh, is how to navigate tomorrow's uh, spatial interfaces. So without ado, uh, I'll just dive in. So I'm Robin, Robin Verheide. Uh, I'm a digital designer at MATE uh, with our very bright team of digital designers. Uh, we're actually working together with a bunch of strategists, a bunch of business analysts, product designers, and a lot more. Uh, together with them, we actually define, design, deliver what's next. So we're an innovation and design company. Um, and I think it's really exciting to work here because we're really on that brink of doing innovative stuff um, and also the part of doing really physical product design with digital design is really, really, that intersect that's really um, key here and really interesting. So diving straight in, uh, of course we also have Slack and um, if I'm looking back like six to eight months, there was WWDC um, where Tim Cook had just one more last thing um, and uh, needless to say, we were hyped, uh, especially Craig. Craig was hyped for all things Disney in the talk. Um, but we were actually really hyped that there was one last thing, but it's a huge thing that Apple was actually finally innovating. So it wasn't another iPhone. Uh, there's something new on the block. So now, uh, eight months later, I think, uh, so we're almost February, and you could pre-order this, and you could have it in your mailbox, uh, I think, in February. So this thing is coming out, and uh, it's creating a lot of buzz. I'm also really excited, because if we look at the timeline, um, we're 20 years uh, from now, so uh, Apple is really, I think, on course to do the Apple Vision Pro Max. Uh, after 18 iterations, we could really uh, to Ready Player One in real life. But also if we look at the timeline, uh, we're also kind of doomed because in 2800, well, we're kind of doomed to be struck to our screens, but uh, this little robot is gonna save us all. <laughs> so back to today, 2024, uh, February, this thing is coming out. And as I said, it's generating a lot of buzz, but um, it's the first device that Apple is going to launch. But of course, it isn't the first device in the world of AR and VR. Um, it's already starting in 1968, and then it's standing a bit on the shoulder of giants, although some failed giants. Everybody, I think, remembers, of, or I hope everybody remembers Google Glass, which really was kind of ahead of its time, we could say. Um, but again, there's like a lot of innovating uh, to be done still. You see there's really like these AR glasses ahead of us, or really the size of sunglasses. So it's really, really exciting uh, what's still to come, but really this device, it feels like a first for all of us. So Apple is joining the race, uh, all of a sudden there's buzz. Like these articles, I've never seen such a huge news storm when like Meta uh, released their headset. So it's still to be seen, like if you would see the headlines, um, is this going to be the future of computing or is this going to be really isolating us? So you could really feel that there's kind of some skepticism in all of these uh, news articles. And why can't we shake that skeptical feeling, I wonder? Um, well, this is one of it. Uh, this is really Black Mirror stuff right uh, in the presentation there. Um, I think time will tell if this is going to be socially accepted because like the googly glass eyes look creepy as hell. Um, this is also one of it, like if we're talking Black Mirror, this is again the same Black Mirror episode, like uh, this is a dad taking a spatial video of his kids and this is all kind of nice, but if you see this is the point of view of the kids, like it's a core memory of dad I don't want. Um, and again, as an outsider to looking somebody using the VR set, you really look like an idiot pointing uh, at things in the air. So time will tell if this will be socially accepted, but um, it's interesting to see if you look back, like all these people now pointing in the air, 40 years ago, this was also really weird. There was a brochure of Macintosh, which released it with the first Mac, and it really said, if you can point, you can use a Macintosh. Like there's a whole, instruction manual, how to point and click. Like, if I look back at it now, it's really so weird. Um, so it got me thinking really like, okay, we're at this new device, is this going to be socially accepted? But like, there's four, 40 years between, and these things like a computer mouse are all so mundane. Um, like, how many years still to come until like actually pointing in the air is also just a regular thing. 
So if we, uh, I think if we talk about innovation and how people will adopt it, uh, this is quite a n uh, known graph that we will pull up. So I think we're still kind of like in the early, uh, like the innovators and the early adopters. And there's always this huge chasm that you have to cross to get to the early majority mainstream market. So actually, if enough programmatic users really believe in like the core functionalities and like the real benefits of your product, then it will really cross that chasm. So if I have to tell, like, okay, the a Apple headset Vision Pro, it's now getting released. Um, it's resting on all of that knowledge from all of those innovators playing and testing ahead. Um, are, is this the release that's going to bring us over that chasm? I don't think so. Um, I think we're still really in the early adopting phase. Um, so not yet. I don't think this release will be like the key milestone that will everybody will get a headset. That being said, I think the early adopting is still OK. Um, if we just leave it to gamers for now, uh, they will really work out how to find ways to play a new instrument or to teach a new instrument. And actually, they will kind of develop how hand tracking is really going to develop. We can also leave it to like fitness enthusiasts who really want their personal coach next to them at all times. We could really learn how ergonomics could work, how they would develop, how really uh, hit targets are going to uh, develop. So I would just say leave it also to them. Leave it to gamers to really test out um, how we could kind of get multiplayer with it and kind of put us outside this isolation. So this is a game that exists today, and you play it like a VR uh, player with a PC player. So the little guy has to escape the VR player who has to catch the little guy. So you're actually playing online or in the same room and also in the same digital environment. Uh, so I think it's really fun that you're not actually tied to your headset, but you could really play with uh, people in the same household. Also, again, I think it's proven by now, uh, Microsoft HoloLens is quite a good example of it. But if we just leave it to professionals, they would also really develop how augmented reality um, could help maybe an installer or an instructor to really install something. So this is Mercedes-Benz. Uh, they have like these really premium dealerships, uh, which have really the next level support. Um, and somebody's really looking with them through the, their cameras uh, what to do. And sports, I think if we leave it to sports, uh, it's a very successful industry. Uh, they will really innovate. If there's a sport with a fixed playing field, uh, like Formula One or uh, football or basketball, uh, I think they will really start to develop how the viewing experience could really be enriched. But also you could leave it to us. Uh, as we at MATE, uh, we're not afraid to dabble in kind of this technology either. Um, so I want to uh, present it a bit on this project. Uh, so Baron, uh, it's almost the most perfect fitting project for UX beers. Um, who or what is Baron? Um, Baron is actually a company, a startup that came with us and they said like, yeah, we want to disrupt the beer market. Uh, if you look at it, beer market, uh, there's only a select of key players and actually what they're doing is we're actually shipping 90% branded water. Uh, so they found a way through molecular brewing technology, uh, what if we would do it at home? What if there was just simply, simply something easy as a device in your kitchen that would just use tap water and the whole industry would be disrupted by shipping just branded water in glass bottles? So they came to us, they said, we have this technology, we want to develop it. Uh, what about you making a consumer-friendly tap machine for us? So, that's it, we, we did it. I hope uh, there are no product designers here kind of shooting me uh, because I will really, really uh, not acknowledge all of their work. It's really been a fascinating project, uh, which I was a very, very tiny part of. Um, but it's just a good port portrayal, um, like with cartridges um, and another set of like fixed brewing ingredients like malt, alcohol, and water that you put in the device, uh, you could really start to brew your own beer at home. So. It would just brew it in a few minutes, um, and through that molecular technology and a set of ingredients um, and a very beautiful product design, uh, we would have really, really a rich product. Now, um, again, I'm going super fast through this, uh, but we don't end up at this product without a lot of prototyping. So. Uh, what product is very good at is cardboard, uh, so that's a really first step to get it tangible. Uh, but we also at the digital side, like 
if we really make a digital product, uh, it's really key to look at the ergonomics also, to look at how does it feel, uh, is it snappy. Uh, so we use a lot, a lot of um, prototyping before it gets to this beautiful product. So this was uh, actually a consumer-friendly machine, so a B2C machine, it would sit inside your kitchen. Um, again, the project rolled uh, really good, we had an MVP of this. Um, I wanted to show a lot more, but then product design said no, uh, that is all NDA. Um, but I'll just quickly go over it and you will, of course, I hope, get a picture. So Brut, Brut is a project that also came to Mate, and he just said uh, we want to make a speedboat. Um, like, making a speedboat in cardboard is going to be really time-consuming. Um, so this was just also the ideal project to make it in VR. Like, how would you really get the client to believe in this? Uh, how to get a sense of scale of things, like the cockpit. Uh, you could sit in different positions. So um, Leander, our product designer, and the whole team, like, they start making it in VR. And it's really impressive to see it and to get a client believing in it that you would otherwise just with some slides or even a cardboard uh, speedboat would never happen. Also Toyota, uh, very NDA-ish, uh, but let's say we would have to design how the next driver console would look like. Again, in VR, you could sit inside that driver console, you again get like the touch of things, you could interact with things, uh, and we could speedily iterate and do uh, other concepts. And then just, we also like to just dabble with uh, stuff like, what if we would have a tool and we just put our cat models in it um, and then Leander could just expand it, just take things out of it. Um, there are some really, really nifty tools out there in which we could really um, enrich and uh, work almost better in VR than you would uh, do in a 3D environment on your desktop. So that's all products. Uh, like, I hope they won't shoot me after this talk to speaking for them. Uh, but I think now it's also time to leave it to us, digital designers. So with the launch of the headset of Apple, it's getting kind of a lot of mainstream buzz already. Uh, a lot of people are going to wear this headset now themselves. So not just our client viewing a product, but all of a sudden we have to think, okay, now we have to kind of make interfaces for people to actually use themselves in the headset. So a key question there would be like, okay, how would we start at this? So uh, Apple is calling it spatial computing now. So why would we build something for spatial computing? Um, like a key memory that I always have is um, on a trip to Japan at Kyoto. Uh, we had a really nice day at the Kamo River and all of a sudden uh, it gets really, really magical. Like the river splits in two and there's like families crossing across this river on like these turtle stone uh, shapes. And it felt so beautiful. I was like, okay, I hardly do this, but I'm gonna take a panorama picture. And I hardly ever watch one of my favorite memories again because it's just shitty. Like I would do it on my phone and I would have to turn my phone, I would have to zoom in. So this is really like a key moment. Like this, is st this still feels broken. Like I could do this on my phone, but viewing it again is really shitty. So what if I would have a headset and the next set of iPhones, really I could take that panorama in a spatial video well, this is like a key immersive moment, like, hey, this is worth it to do it immersive. This is something that's still kind of broken or not ideally on our set of devices right now, and this new device is probably going to fix that. So panoramas, this is one of the examples I really, really think is going to uh, bring the device forward. Otherwise, like learning, I think most of us uh, might have dabbled with some of these apps that are AR and then it portrays something on your desk and then you could interact with it, but you have to hold your phone and it's all very, very unnatural. So if you would just have a headset, you have your hands free, you could just control it, uh, interact with it. Like again, this feels really a key immersive moment uh, that's worth designing for. And finally, like with this device, you wouldn't have one monitor. You could have multiple monitors, in an infinite amount of monitors positioned all around yourself. So again, this feels like a whole new world that's going to open that you would never could replicate with our current devices. So if we're looking at all of those examples, all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, uh, there are no browser windows anymore, there are no fixed flat windows anymore, everything is moving kind of in three dimensions and uh, in all depth. So actually we're kind of thinking like, oh shit, is my current knowledge stack of all things digital design all really flat? 
does it have to get physical? And I do think so. I think we could really learn from uh, product design. So this is probably basic knowledge for our product designers. But all of a sudden, when we could move monitors in an open space, we have to think about what's the most comfortable arm reach. What is, we have to think about eye levels. What's going to be above eye level? What's going to be inside your field of view? So all of these things are like physical knowledge tech. And all of a sudden, our digital designers are kind of getting uh, into this territory now. Also, I think like if we are going to build environments, be it we're going to enrich a current environment through augmented reality or make a whole new environment in virtual reality, we kind of have the opportunity to change percep perception. So if you're in an apartment, we could really, in AR, make it larger for you. Like just like the basics of interior design, again, us the digital designers, we've probably never dabbled with it, and we could really learn from it uh, now that we're stepping into 3D. So let's start with the basics. So what are some constraints if we're thinking about making something for spatial design? Um, really, the most basic thing is um, you would have windows. So these are still like the very flat browser windows. But the only addition is you could have an infinite number of windows uh, in your 3D space. But they're still very flat windows. Um, if you want to move into three dimensions, let's say on a fixed space, then it becomes a volume. Uh, so you could really have an object there and you could interact with it, but it stays on that plane, that's a volume. And then spaces are actually when everything is around you and you're standing inside a space um, filled with windows or volumes. So to explain that further, um, let's say you have multiple windows next to each other, that's a shared space, so you could really interact with all of them together. But let's say we want to really open one application deeper, then we could open it in a full space, be it one of the panorama, for example, or really it opens a full-blown environment where you could stand in. I talked about like these ergonomics and like field of view. Uh, if you're really looking at the basics, uh, we could say if you're putting on a headset and you're looking straight ahead, you have kind of a minimal point of view of around 90 degrees. Uh, if you do a comfortable head turn, it would expand to really 150 degrees. And then being a maximum head turn, like you really want to see what's next to you. Uh, that's going to take some effort. So ideally, that's not a sweet spot, of course, that you want to design for. But it's there. Viewing distance, also really the basics. Uh, if you would put it closer than a half a meter to your face, like if you would hold a pencil, you really see cross-eyed. So that's really a no-go. That's the no-go zone in augmented reality um, or virtual reality. What's actually the sweet spot is kind of 10 meters. So there we really have like with our eyesight only just a strong depth perception. Um, and then when you're getting on 20 meters, uh, that's kind of where we're getting kind of like the limit of depth perception just by using our eyes. And if we would then need visual cues like parallax or overlapping images uh, to see really ah, this is deeper than the other. So if you would combine these, uh, if you would start to design something in a spatial environment, uh, it kind of looks like this if you would all overlap them. So you would have the absolute no-go zone around half a meter, and then the area of interest gets around 10 meters and in that cone of like 90 degrees. So let's say we would design an app with some environment, but of course our user has to interact with something ahead of them. Uh, this is kind of how you would kind of sketch it with those constraints. So knowing these basics, we can start to look at like how those interfaces are going to be in spatial design. Um, there are two key categories that I think are really just relevant are uh, looking at those interfaces and interacting with those interfaces. So when we're uh, talking about everything eyes-wise, um, Placement is really important. Uh, it's, it builds upon those constraints like, let's start, we have this. This comes straight out of the guidelines of Apple. So you could open it in Figma and start designing. Like, there's no grid. There's no responsiveness. Uh, what actually is my grid that I'm going to hold on to? Um, and it's actually your field of view grid. So you would see that Apple already does it in their guidelines. Like barely something leaves like that 60 degree angle uh, because otherwise it's really you have to uh, turn your head a lot uh, so let's say this is apple safari um, and it's starting to leave that 60 degrees but you would hardly see anything that they now are launching uh, going further than that 90 degree field of view 
Then something really interesting that they're doing is um, how to work with pop-ups and modals. So what they're actually doing is um, if you have main content, uh, it, it gets pushed to the back, and then your modal is actually staying at the same depth level. So I kind of portrayed it like this. So let's say this is a bad example, and your modal is always coming towards your user. It's very straining for your eyes to constantly shift depth. So actually, when we always have these sidebars and these modals, your user constantly have to shift depth. And what Apple is doing is just the other way around. So if there's a modal, it stays at the exact same uh, Z uh, axis, and then your secondary content is just moving to the back. I think it's really nifty, and uh, I have never even thought about it. Like, in a browser, we're so used that it just moves in front of the content, but actually they're moving it back to really ease constraint on your eyes. Something really magically that they're introducing, uh, and I'm just really eager to see how it works, uh, is eye tracking. So eye tracking is not new, but they're kind of introducing all of these little micro interactions, like you would have a sidebar or a menu that's just nicely tucked away to the side, and if you're looking at it, then it expands. And then even on hover, you could really look at something and Apple will, will state it. I think it's really mind-blowing. Uh, I think it's just going to be a whole new level of ease of use and hover interactions. Like, if this works really well and we have to go back on our laptops and hover over something with a mouse, it's going to feel really outdated, I think. Um, but there is something to say, like, eye tracking isn't really a precise science. Like, there are tons of studies who've already done it. There are tons of applications who've already done it. Um, and if you design for precision, then it's going to end badly. Like, uh, a study just says, like, if you're reading a basic sentence, uh, your eye has the tendency to scatter around. Like, you would go to immediately to a, a word that attracts you. Like, that's the area of interest. And then you would go back to a keyword. And, like, you're not reading from left to right immediately. Um, so if Apple would really design something for precision, uh, it's going to be all over the place. So I'm really, really eager to see how they fix it. Uh, but I kind of trust in them because they already did it with the iPhone. Um, the very first iPhone really had to kind of teach people to type on a touch screen, and we were not used to it. So you really had these precise keys. And again, their mantra was like, we're not going to design for precision, but we're going to design for forgiveness. So. What they actually did was behind the scenes, they would kind of predict what word you were going to type and what letter that you were obviously going to type. So they kind of behind the scenes made the hit area a lot bigger, so we'd, you would always hit it right. And I think there's probably a very, very smart UX and development behind it that's going to make this also feel like magic. So that's everything some key things that we, uh, if we were going to look at an interface, of course, we're also going to use our hands. Uh, and building upon those uh, typing, in VR, uh, we're all going to look like boomers typing one letter at a time. Uh, it's just like, if there's one tech guy who knows all the tech, it's this guy, and he still types with like one finger ahead. You just can't lose it. Um, so that's really a remark. I think Apple is not going to solve this, but they're trying. Um, so what they're trying is uh, they're not making a keyboard flat. They're trying to get that tactile feeling of really hitting your key. Um, so they're elevating buttons on a keyboard. And if you press them, you really get a sense of, OK, I press this button. Um, but still, I think if you're going to do a quick search, you're going to use this. If you're going to work in Word, you're not going to use this. Um, but you can also see that they're kind of anticipating this. Uh, they're really, really developing uh, text-to-speech. So again, eye tracking. If you're looking at the microphone, it knows you're probably going to speak to search. And then it j turns into like a speak field. Uh, and I think it's really, really nifty. Um, but they're really, really already making uh, huge steps on uh, what's out there. Then I think a category that's really the most interesting as a UX designer and as a UI designer, uh, besides typing, how would we start to interact with our hands? Um, I think the very first category is really the most basic one. It's how would we inspect something? How would we manipulate something? And I think most of the basics we already got down on a touch device or uh, some other device, but we already learned how to pinch, how to double tap, um, how to zoom in. 
it's really the next category of like these familiarities and like physical actions that get really, really interesting because all of a sudden, as a digital designer, um, we're kind of learning all the way, like, okay, uh, you have to save this, or, uh, okay, you have to delete this. Like, there has to be a menu, there has to be a drop down, and all of a sudden, we could lose again all of those abstraction of all those years and just go back to the real world, like what feels familiar to do with your hands. So one of the examples I think is always really soothing is if you're in an editor in VR, why delete something if you can just yeet it into empty air and then it gets deleted? Um, of course, uh, a good remark of one of our designers in the team, like, yeah, what if you want to undo it? Uh, there is a Control-Z button on the controller, um, but I think it's really just a familiar thing and it's also so satisfying and you don't have to look for a menu or a drop-down. You just throw it behind you and it's gone. So I think it's kind of really, this is what I would love if I have to design for spatial design, like, hey, what, what are we doing in the real world? Let's make it fun and satisfying in VR. Another thing is, again, if we think about how we're doing it on a browser or a desktop, like we have to go into menus, we have to copy, we have to paste, like how would we do it in real life? We would just grab things from the table and move it to another space. It could be just as simple as in VR, uh, in spatial design, just grab it, and I think there's going to be a lot of these really nifty interactions. Something that's really cool is also like if we look at the real world, uh, we're bound to, of course, real world constraints. What if we would do uh, an environment that's really looking like the real world, but we don't have to think about constraints anymore, like if I would have a cupboard and I would have 10 plates, okay, I, I would have to buy 10 plates. Well, in mixed reality, I could just have one plate and it just could be an infinite number of plates. So it's really these things I wouldn't have to model it 10 times to just have an interaction with it. Speaking about cupboards, uh, there's also a really interesting ID. Uh, like these are configurators of today. So I really love this. Like I think this is one of the most beautiful configurators to make a shelf. Uh, but it's going to be really outdated if people are going to do it in uh, spatial design. So let's say you would have a model uh, and it's just as easy as like, yeah, I want this just 30 centimeters wider. You would just grab the side, you would pull it. And then the configurator would say, yeah, now there are 19 designs remaining. And if I leave it, like the ghost states, like skeleton states of like maybe the three designs left are then visioned and you could select them. I think it would be really a lot, lot more intuitive than going through these little sliders. And I would absolutely not do these sliders in VR, but I would have to think of like UX like this. And then something that's also interesting, like um, confirm buttons. I think maybe they are a thing of the past in uh, spatial design. Like we could just use gestures, like give a thumbs up or just wave to a next panel. Like we also have to think like all of these outdated things, maybe by then like a confirm button, do we still really need it? And then lastly, if we just combine all of these things like a Word document could be so much more, and how would you interact? All of these things would come together, like I would just grab myself closer to something, uh, how would I search something? Like it's really interesting when you get all of these familiarities into each other. Uh, I think that's where we're going to see in a few years really some, uh, some magic. Now, if we would just say, okay, I'm feeling up to the challenge, I want to design this, um, it's going to be really a cost value project, like as said, I still think this technology is in like the early adopter phase, um, but needless to say, everybody could just start prototyping a concept. How would we do it? Uh, of course, everything starts on paper, uh, then bringing it to digital and then even into spatial. So how would we start? Uh, I think everybody does this now for their website or anything other. You just sketch it uh, and I could say, in like these 10 years, I've become very good at drawing rectangles, but I cannot draw in perspective. So uh, this is going to be a challenge, but there are tons of tons of like these cheat sheets where you could really see uh, all of these constraints already applied. So you don't have to do like the constraints anymore. Think about it. You could just have an idea, a concept, and kind of already quickly test it and have these constraints already mapped out for you. So this is another example. You could really already see like, okay, this is my field of view. This is going to be to the right side. This is going to be to the left side. Um, and an interesting thing about this example, and I tested it, 
Um, let's say you draw something, and you want to draw something like a carousel, let's say, and I want to see what's going to be outside of my field of view, uh, and at the right is somebody else, maybe. Um, you could just take a picture of this, um, and really low fidelity-wise, put it in any 360 viewer. So you could do it in VR, but you could also, let's say in After Effects, you could map it onto a sphere, uh, and then view it with your camera. But in VR, it's really nifty that you could just upload it. Uh, you have to kind of tinker with it, but then you get really to the right point of view, where you can already look up, look down, you would see like your perspective. Um, and really low fidelity wise, you could already test your concept and show it to a client to maybe get to that next thing. So when you get it done on paper, how to bring it digitally? Um, so let's say that previous example, like okay, I sketched this, but uh, I want to happen this in a certain environment. And of course, it's going to be a lot of cost value work to maybe just do a concept a bit, uh, I want to do it in an outside landscape or maybe another landscape. Uh, well, AI is here to help us. Like, I've put this into mid-journey, um, and you could say, if I want a mountain landscape, you kind of have to tinker with it, and especially important is to put that first word, like equi-rectangular, you get kind of a shape like this. I would not show a client this, but of course, if you would uh, enhance it with Magnific, it's going to really enhance its depth level and like the resolution level. Again, if you put it in this 360 viewer, you kind of have your full environment already mapped out. Like the work that you could do in mid-journey is so fast and you could really test just like a new environment um, and then start to put your interface in front of it. So just your backdrop, you could really, really easily do this uh, concept-wise. So as said, if you would then put in front of that backdrop an interface, um, it's still the flatlands. Like if you would open um, Apple's Vision OS kit, I would highly suggest you start with this. It really has all of those constraints already in and a lot, a lot of documentation in there. Um, but of course, you would have to work in Figma. Uh, it's still going to be really flat, but again, as a concept, and if you could add it onto the, those layers that you already did with maybe a mid-journey background, uh, I think you could really bring your concept together. So that's then just key how to make it spatial. Um, like I said, these are like tools that we use, like Gravity Sketch or Shapes XR. Uh, and the really handy uh, thing about it is it has a connection with Figma. So a designer could really work on artboards in Figma, and there's somebody using the VR headset, uh, and it just syncs immediately. So you could really test how the interface has to go there. Uh, it's really, really a cool uh, way of making things spatially. Then there's kind of like the heavy lifting tools. I would not suggest for concepting, but again, if you get enough buy-in from maybe a client, it's going to be developing in Unity, in Xcode, uh, but that's really the heavy lifting. Uh, what I would suggest is if you're still in a concept phase, um, there's kind of these new tools, uh, like a new wave of tools like Spline, like Busy, like Playbook, um, and they're actually looking more like we are used to, like they're almost like a Figma for 3D, uh, and it's really easy, really uh, less clutter, less really a barrier to start going, and uh, again, in these tools, you could also really sync your Figma with it. So it's really, really a nice tool to already get a bit spatial. And now you could say like, yeah, Robin, these are all really nice 3D models, but again, I don't know how to make 3D models. Well, neither do I, uh, but AI does. Um, so let's see, uh, there's a tool like Luma, uh, they are really well known for their nerves, but Luma is also a 3D model AI generator. So you could really type in, I want a pint of uh, beer uh, in a glass, and it really instantly makes 3D models for you. Uh, you could still tinker with it and then download it. And then you could export it, bring it into your spatial design. So I could really put this beer, you could make it larger, et voila. Like there's actually really for a concept level, you have so many of these tools which really creates a quick sketch, even inside spatial, inside paper, or uh, digitally to maybe get a client to have buy-in. So I would suggest if you're kind of intrigued, uh, start on paper. Like if you would have just the basics of spatial constraints, you could start using it on paper already, really get uh, ahead of track. Uh, then when you go digitally, 
uh, it's really key to look at these new concepts, like what is eye tracking going to do for me? You could already maybe look at it in Figma uh, and really look at like new UX, like, okay, uh, do I have to look at eye level? Do I have to look at arm reach? And then really, if you want to bring it into 3D, I would suggest uh, do it in these like new easier tools, uh, just these sandboxing tools. And then you can start to already uh, look at like, what are these familiar interactions I could do with it? And again, like everything that you do with it, we're still in this early adoption phase. And I truly believe like everything that we're doing today as designers already on this is really going to get us to the next thing. Um, and then what is next if I have to think ahead of the future? Um, I'm really optimistic. I've, I've portrayed like the graph of like the user adoption, but I think the only graph that matters is this, and it's really valid for every kind of product. Like just give it time and price will go down and usefulness will go up. Like if we leave it in the hands of gamers, of developers, um, eventually there are going to be a lot of use cases. And then when it gets past that threshold, um, I truly believe in this medium. Um, I really think my children uh, are going to learn in a more interactive way, in a more spatial way. Um, I truly think if they're ever going to renovate my house or their own house, they will have a digital twin of it. Uh, and if they want a new wall or something, they're really going to do it really fast in VR. And I think if I'm ever going to get a heart surgery, uh, my doctor is going to put VR glasses on me and is going to explain what he's going to do. And again, like really, if we're looking at the past, uh, I think I'm really positive and really optimistic. And uh, everything that we're doing now as early adopters is the thing that will get us to the next thing. Thank you for listening. <laughs>